Okay, so as I mentioned, we're going to do just a little more in-depth work to see what shows up for people. Again, this depends on your uh, inner sense awareness. And because we've been doing this work all day, actually, you may get way more than you would have gotten or expected that you would have gotten um, when we started. The, um, I think probably the best thing to do is just pick a chakra. Um, try to pick one that interested you when you went through, um, where it looked like there was something you want to know more about, as opposed to, oh yeah, four, oh yeah, six, oh yeah, seven, or, you know. Um, it may be that we don't cover all the chakras, that, that there won't be somebody to talk about every one of them, but anything that we do to expand our knowledge base by people sharing their experience is going to be useful no matter what chakra we're focusing on. And uh, we're not going to spend a huge amount of time focusing because, um, as I've discovered in my classes, it takes people a little while to build up their ability to hold the imagery and keep the information coming and not contaminate it, so to speak, with too much thinking about it. And um, I'll do what I can to help people understand mysterious experiences, but I can't guarantee that what I think might be going on really is what's going on. I can only point you in the direction of what I think is possible. So let's get ready. Close your eyes once again. And focus your attention inward. Take a couple breaths as a sign of moving out of ordinary waking consciousness, so to speak, into something more inner sense based. And it, just take a moment to read the energy of the room. To me, it feels calm, quiet, interested. Um, I don't think anybody's bored. That's good. And then r remind yourself or request the presence of your higher energy hands again. And once more, take a reading of the energy in the room. And there's a little point I want to make here. Any form of inner sense development, any form of clairvoyant development is really benefited by comparison. So constantly be aware of what you're experiencing now and when there's a shift, how is it different? So I asked you to feel the energy of the room when people were just getting ready. And then I asked you to feel the energy of the room after the higher energy hands came in. Making a simple comparison like that can tell you something about your inner senses and how they're working. So if you really want to be daring, ask your higher energy hands to choose the chakra that you want to work with. Or you can take your pick based on what you thought was interesting from when we looked at them before or you can just choose one. And this is what I call an open-ended practice. Nothing may show up, or something may show up, or you may not understand it, or you may doubt it. Just be receptive to whatever shows up. And ask your energy hands to show you anything you need to know about that chakra. and ask them to do anything that needs to be done to help or heal or balance that chakra. And I'll just be silent for a couple minutes and then we'll come out of it and talk about it.
And ask your energy hands to give you a clear signal to let you know that they're done. A simple signal is thumbs up to say done, thumbs down to say still working. And when you get that thumbs up signal, I'd like for you to open your eyes and sit quietly. And I'll just check to see, and when most people's eyes are open, that's when we'll start the discussion. And you can keep working if you want to, if you're not quite done yet. But I think we'll start the discussion if anybody has something that they would like to share, ask about, and so on. So I was looking at it from, you know, like in front, like out of, out of there. But I saw it, instead of just seeing, you know, like the shape of it, I saw... Which big, chakra were you working on? The fourth. Okay. I just asked for it to go to whichever yep. one I needed to work on. So I saw a figure in there. Um, when I first started, the very first image I saw was the woman with the whole white, you know, outfit. Now, yes. this was the person in a green hooded, um, almost like a Buddhist figure, in, all in green, though, and then a lacy you know, sort of like a designed area around, and then you could see through it too. So that was the the imagery. But I thought it was odd, the person in with the Im- imagery. Okay. Um, do you know about green Tara? Have you ever heard that expression? Vaguely. Okay. So in Buddhism, there is... Uh, a goddess named Tara who comes in different colors. Each one of them has a slightly different focus for meditation. And uh, you mentioned that it was a Buddha-like figure and female and green. And so there might be a message there about looking that up. Um, it's a, it, there's a devotional quality, I think, about green Tara. And so it could be a message either about 
the quality of your fourth chakra, the way that you're living from it, or about some work to do or some... And I think also, remember, there's this consciousness element that we talked about uh, at the beginning in the morning. Sometimes beings can show up as caretakers or guides for our understanding and learning about a particular thing. And a caretaker helps to hold the pattern of the chakra so that it'll stay in its highest functioning. Um, a guide would be one that would teach you. So my question would be, if you look up green Tara and resonate with something, does it feel like it's something that you're already living from? Or does it feel like something you might want to explore more and get some teaching on? Oh, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I worked on the third chakra, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it was weird because it the image was to elevate, and it kind of it was attached to cords, more than one, and it's like would be facing forward, turning up, facing forward, turning up, and there were bright primary colored little objects sometimes that would, it's nothing I would have ever kind of conceived of on my own. So. Did your energy hands only point these things out or did it change anything that you saw in any way? Um, it seemed to me that they were showing me this is what, how I work with that. Ah, okay. Yeah. Chords are an interesting thing, and if you look into the um, Carla McLaren book, it's also true of the Friedlander book, Basic Psychic Development. Chords are attachments and energy flow between you and other people, and sometimes they can connect to particular chakras. And the idea is that they define an aspect of the relationship that you have with that person which could be a good thing or a bad thing. It could be a habit or it could be just what the flow is between you and that person. And she suggests making the experiment, and I use, in my classes, I use the energy hands to make the experiment of dissolving or cutting those cords. Um, sometimes that can give you a sense of freedom from a relationship if it's stuck it at least invites the energy to form in a new way, which can open up new possibilities. And so um, there's a whole practice involved with going through the energy bodies and going through the chakras and cutting the cords that you have with people in order for you to be really free and for them to be really free. So um, I'm glad that showed up as a, an invitation for people to look for them and to explore them. Beyond that, I can't say. It's something that you would have to do more. I mean, you can ask the energy hands to show you where the cord goes to and maybe get some idea of who is at the other end of it. If it's a person, that would be one thing. What I have found is that when there is a cord between you and somebody that you have some kind of important soul growth contract with, you can't cut through it. And it'll show up as gold or silver or platinum. Um, it, it just means that you're bonded. So um, if you cut through a cord and it shows up again, you know, there's, there's a deep karmic bond, usually. I had wanted to do the sixth or seventh chakra because it's before I kept falling asleep. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if I'm tired, I just, whatever. Anyway, so, but then I thought I'd just let it go. But I think it was working on the sixth chakra. But I saw these hands, um, they had like a scarf, and it was like cleaning, like cleaning something out, kind of. And then it was swinging back and forth so that like this was disconnected from down here. And then, um, then all of a sudden something got like sucked out of here. And then it went back out, and it popped out like a flower, like a hibiscus, and then it just like stuck in his head, and then, then they wiped their hands there like, I'm done. Okay. I don't know. It's weird. Well, 
So you went through a process, and it was obviously motivated, not by you or your imagination. And it's not always easy to tell what the process is, but chakras can get gunked up. Um, the sixth chakra, I think, is especially a problem because of our mental con tendency to conceptualize things. So getting that kind of stuff pulled out and then twisted around and renewed, or some kind of polishing sensation, or, I mean, again, I don't know your personal imagery, but um, I would make the experiment of doing that with all of my chakras if I were you, because it, even if you don't know what uh, happened, they're, they're um, I mean, they're going in the direction of their highest functioning. The one thing that I will say, though, is that disconnecting, some people try to make their sixth chakra do what their seventh chakra should do, and it's partially because they don't know any better, but it's sometimes because of different spiritual teachings that they've taken in. So it's possible that uh, you got cleared out something that you had taken in from a spiritual teaching that wasn't needed, and the, the two chakras were disconnected so that you can actually have a fully functioning sixth and a fully functioning seventh chakra. That would be my guess. Um, where you will go with that next will be interesting to hear about. Well, I was going to, I was having a debate, should I let my hands do it or should I choose it myself? And um, I thought, well, I had, going through it earlier, I had some trouble with, I think it's the second, the one that's orange. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then I said, no, I'm just going to let my hands do it. And the hands went right down there anyway. <laughs> and I've been having some health issues, some, you know, especially the past few days. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I need more immunity. I need more vitality. So whatever it is that that needs, please just do it. And so all of a sudden, there's a lot of stuff going on. I can't remember. It's just a lot of work going on down there. And then all of a sudden, the hands went up to my throat chakra and said, well, we have to do both because they're connected. Mm -hmm. And then I'm wondering... I, that, and then when I went through them before, I had that same idea that there was some fear, there was some holding back, there was a f I was being afraid to express myself and creativity not is kind of not being able to come out. And I didn't know if that that throat chakra would be connected with a second chakra, and how that would, or if yeah, I. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we can explore that. I mean, or you can explore that. We won't have time for it here. Um, it's true that the whole chakra system is related. And so if there's a problem, it may not be localized in only one chakra. Um, and typically in our culture, the second chakra has to do with permission to be in the body and enjoy it. And that often means um, letting yourself have quality sense experience, asking for it or saying no if it's something that you don't need. I mean, I think the uh, folks at, at Esalen, um, being young back in the 70s and interested in the idea of sexual liberation, did a little bit of a disservice to the later chakra system by identifying it as sexuality only. And um, that's why I think it's important to emphasize that our, our bodies have a, have a sense-based contact with every level of reality. And there's a lot of family and social conditioning about why that's not okay, that we have to overcome. And it may be that... Uh, storytelling is one of the ways of unwinding that. So for example, if you were to go back into your past and look at some of that conditioning about you know, the body and what was or wasn't okay and what is, you know, where is it caught up that you're not able to give yourself permission, if that's the problem, to have quality sense experience, and expressing that, telling that story, 
that could that I'm just speculating that that could be one reason why those two chakras were showing up that way. Whatever adjustment that you made energetically is sometimes completed by the process of sharing it, whether you share it in writing or whether you share it with someone else. As human beings, I think we can be pretty good at self-deception. Mm. So I'm wondering if at some point you have absolute clarity or um, confidence maybe that the hands are there working on you and, and it's not just you thinking that you are. I mean that they are. So it's not your own visualization. Yes. The actual problem is with the mental body. And the mental body, if we're living from there, it wants proof. And the mental body is also the source of ambivalence and anxiety and a number of things that we struggle with. And it conceptualizes things so that if if what you're perceiving isn't what you expect to perceive, there can be a, a battle going on. And it's willful also, so it can impose itself on what you perceive. And you have to find a kind of workaround because our mental bodies are so strongly developed and, and supported to develop in all these ways in our culture. So what you really have to do if you're experimenting with this work is operate as if it were true for a while to see what there is, to see what shows up. And at a certain point, either the question of whether it is true or not goes away, in which case you've got the information that you need, or you start getting the information you need to tame the mental body and go to a higher level and perceive it from there, or you give up because the mental body has essentially talked you out of it. Um, which happens a lot. So anytime you hold a very strong belief and you're confronted with the opportunity to explore the world from a different perspective, there's a fight between the belief that you're holding and the one that you want to bring in. And it could be not just a belief, it could be a perspective or a worldview or whatever. And one of the ways that you make the transfer is you stop gathering evidence in favor of this and start gathering evidence in favor of that. But even that's a bit of a problem because if the basic drive is looking for proof, we almost always gather evidence on both sides of the question in equal amounts. And in a way, the only way out of that is what I call a provisional belief, which means I'll operate as if this were true and see where it takes me. And in a sense, I think that's what the Buddha was teaching, that everything is a view and there are wrong views. But what's really wrong about a wrong view isn't the fact that it exists, it's the fact that we hold it as the only one. So if you start to realize that there's a, there's a certain power in shifting from one view to another and gathering whatever information is there for you, um, a lot of growth happens. And gradually, what you experience as the world is made up of all the different views that you've used as a way of gathering information about the world. Um, I guess another way of putting that is uh, we can define reality on the basis of um, all the different definitions of it we're comfortable with, including no definition or a no self definition. Um, so the very best thing really is just, okay, here's a view. This might be a way of looking at things. For some people, coming into theosophy would have to be approached in that way. You know, if theosophy talks about reincarnation and someone says, well, prove to me that reincarnation exists, what do you do? But if you think about the view of the opportunity of experiencing multiple lifetimes, things change. You might get more relaxed about the idea of dying and so on. And after a while, it's pretty clear that the benefits of that view are, it's useful enough to you that you'll want to hold on to it, whether you can prove that reincarnation exists or not. And then we just keep gathering views. So what I'm offering is a view. And you experiment with it, and it's possible that 
over time the visualizations show up in a way that you feel like you have confidence in them. This takes time because, as I mentioned, the visualizations have um, a meaning, but in a personal symbol system that you need to learn over time. This is why they're teachers, I guess, to kind of help people sort through those things. This is just a question. Um, I'm not doing anything at the moment since I just moved out here a couple of years ago, but I used to do uh, hypnosis and imagery work with clients. And every once in a while, not very often, but there would be somebody that absolutely saw nothing. So, and I don't know if there'd be anybody in this room that had that experience today where there just was no imagery that comes up for them. And so, I, you know, I would try to go through, uh, bring out some scents or do some, you know, like wash scents over your, like a like rose or something, or, or go, approach it from a different way. So I wondered if you had any suggestions for people that might, when you're telling them, well, see what, you know, comes up for you on your third chakra or your fourth, what happens when nothing comes up for them? They just draw a blank. I mean, I associate it with trauma sometimes, but um, I'd like your thoughts on that. Okay, that's actually a very good follow-up question to the one that came previously. Um, there are multiple reasons why something like this could occur. One of them is the mental body is interfering. It expects something. It expects an instant gratification of this, you know, looking at the chakras. It may be very willful. It may be in a battle of sorts with the, the higher bodies, the soul. This is one of the reasons why I ask people to bring in energy hands, because if the energy hands are showing you things and they come from a higher level of being, that mental body can get interested in seeing what there is to learn and soften up a bit. And the hands are doing the directing instead of your own will. Another possible problem is people may not use their inner senses along the lines of imagery. They may be more comfortable with energy. And so if you ask them to feel into what yeah. is there, that can be helpful. But then ask them to invite an image to come in that somehow expresses the feeling. And then they may be able to come up with something. Another one is the mental body works very quickly. So if it's posed with this challenge of coming up with an image, but it doesn't know which image is the right one, and it's got family and social conditioning about always having to be the best and do the right and be the head of the class and so on. Um, it could be sorting through a dozen different images. They might all be valid, or only one of them might be valid. But the course, the, the, what actually happens is every one of them is getting dismissed for some reason. And um, in that case, the work is really slowing down the mental body so that it's willing to watch and wait for something to show up instead of um, having a kind of expectation of instant gratification. Earlier there was a question about um, do the, are the chakras always active? And I mentioned that sometimes a chakra can quote unquote go offline, in which case nothing will be visible. Um, and then your idea of a chakra not showing up because there's trauma there, I think that's also valid and worth exploring. So um, it's, it's a single experience that can have a multiple, uh, you know, multiple answers for the cause, and the context is really important. But I think the most important thing, following up on the earlier question, was the idea of the way men the mental body can interfere with things. I think that's, in, a lot of people would come to see me for trauma. And I just have one other question. Like, okay. One person was so problematic, it seemed like they just turned away from their higher guidance altogether. I'm wondering if you've had experience with people like that, how you would reach out to them or how you could gently try to get them to look at that higher guidance if that was right for them at that point. Over the years, I've learned that it's perfectly legitimate if you're a spiritual teacher or a healer to recognize that there are suitable and unsuitable students. Right. And that's not a judgment. 
it's a matter of my own personal time and energy, the support that I would need to give. A lot of learning can come from trying to figure out a way to work with someone like that. And there comes a point when you feel like you're done with the trench work, so to speak, and that you really only want to work with the suitable students. And if somebody is that unwilling to listen inwardly, you become a projection point for that person's difficult relationship with their soul, and a lot of stuff gets acted out. If you can do that comfortably in a sort of psychodrama type session, something useful might come from it. Otherwise, their life is a, a search for what they think will cure them or make things different. There's usually a lot of urgency. It has to happen instantly. I've learned that these are all qualities of what I would call an unsuitable student. And the hard thing for anybody who's service-oriented is turning anyone down because it feels like it's an act of judgment and not an act of compassion. Um, and yet I think in the larger picture you have to understand that somewhere the door that person needs to go through exists. And it's not always your job to show them that that's the case. Um, so I'll just probably end there. I mean, it breaks my heart when I've encountered an unsuitable student, but I also have learned to recognize that there may be suitable students that it's better for me to pour my energy out into, and there's someone somewhere that will be available for that person. Thank you for asking that question, because <laughs> that's me. <laughs> I was just thinking like, oh my goodness, room full of people having all these experiences, and I'm the only one, you know, not able to visualize anything. But um, something I experienced is that visualizing was really almost impossible, but yeah. physical pain all of a sudden came up, and then it disappeared really quickly. So uh, that was just something subtly I was experiencing. And as you're talking about unsuitable students, um, uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, even if teacher, a teacher or teachers feel or think that okay, you're probably not my student, but then what if that student keeps knocking? <laughs> Personally, I will always try to find a way. If there's willingness and motivation, I'll always try to find a way. And something I said at the very beginning of today's work was, if you have any experience at all, something is started that could lead to something else. So remember I said that the inner sense information can come up on the basis of noticing a difference. You noticed the difference between a pain that was there and then that it wasn't. That's your beginning point. Maybe that's all you have to work with right now. But if you have the sense of energy hands and you're asking them, even if you can't see them, to help you work with a pain and you feel a um, calming or, a, or an unwinding of that pain, that's your way of working. You don't necessarily need the imagery. All you need to do is ask the question. Hopefully, I've given a, out today a bunch of tools or interventions or opportunities, exercises, practices, or experiments. And at some point, things show up. Um, there may be a next step beyond this one. The best I can do for you, though, is, is to let you know that noticing that there was pain and then there wasn't pain indicated something was happening. Over time, you may get more awareness of or more ability to dialogue back and forth between the level of your being that creates that experience and the level that's having the experience that's talking to me right now. Um, it may be along the lines that I'm teaching. It may be along some other lines. It could be that you're a mystic in the sense that energy is your true way of experiencing things and you just haven't found the conceptual system that you resonate with that can allow you to have those experiences? Who's to say? But I wouldn't, if somebody is very highly motivated, I would never dismiss them as a suitable 
or unsuitable student. You always try to find interventions. Um, and yet, there are those who, um, well, I'll use an example. Um, I had a client once who was very depressed, and I realized early on in our work together that he had investment in being the best depressed person there ever was, which meant the one that nobody ever under any circumstances could treat. So there wasn't a lot of wiggle room there, <laughs> and that is somebody I would have called an unsuitable student. Just a comment about how useful it was every time you ask us to, to feel the room. Yeah. For people who have been meditating for years, the, 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 uh, the eyes are always looking inwardly. Mm -hmm. And to have a sense and actually perceive the, the huge difference between the moment before and that one, it was really um, quite an experience. And you know, at, at some point the thought of like, how didn't, you know, I never thought of, of looking out. <laughs> ah, yeah. You know, I never thought of looking out. That's really an interesting comment because, <laughs> because we have, no, we have all of these subtle bodies. They all have their inner senses and we're all looking in. I mean, there are spiritual practices that say, look, with, look within. Although some of us are also very self-absorbed and never look outside. So in a sense, when I'm teaching people about working with the subtle bodies and the inner senses, what I'm teaching them is to look out. You know, if you can focus your attention in your astral body, of course, if we're looking at the chakras of the astral body, that's looking within. But there's also a window out there, too. And that's another, that's probably another seminar, but um, yeah, look out. It's, yeah. it's good, good practice. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I mean everybody, it's everybody. We don't look out of ourselves. I have a question about the energy hands. Uh, you talked earlier about the energy hand and then the monad, am I saying yeah. that right? Energy hands. Um, why would you choose one over the other? It depends on how comfortable you are. Like with beginning students, I work with the soul level or causal energy hands because they're easy to relate to. And the thing is, there, there's a certain need to overcome the desire for control in the experiences. So if you've got energy hands that are maybe just a little bigger than your own personal hands and you you're asking them to do things and they're doing things and showing things to you, a working relationship develops. If you bring in this higher level, the monadic level energy hands, they're big, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And you have to achieve a certain degree of spiritual maturity before you'll allow an experience of that kind. And it's not just giving everything up either. There still needs to be an active process of working back and forth. Um, but the tendency would be either to fight them, which isn't useful for spiritual growth. Um, you don't want to develop a will strong enough to oppose your energy hands if they're coming from the monadic level because that's in the opposite direction of the process of evolution back to the source and it leads to pride and arrogance and in the theosophical tradition, black magic. On the other side of things, you don't want to turn into a puddle either and expect that level of your being to do everything for you. Um, if, you're, if you do end up turning into a puddle, they can put you back together again pretty well. Um, but if you do it all the time, you're kind of an unsuitable student for them, I guess, and they may go off and do something else. So also, students, I've noticed, have... Um, a different capacity for the inner sense experience of working with them. It was interesting for me in this group to introduce the possibility and to have people just dive right in. Yeah. So there are a lot of people obviously in the room who've been on a spiritual path or developing a spiritual practice of some kind. And for those of you who, who were feeling the energy of the room, it is amazing what happens when there are people in a room who are connected with that level of being. Everything changes. It gets so quiet and peaceful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes 
I mean, personally as a teacher, I just want to shut up and you know hang around with a bunch of people who are in that place. But that's not what you paid me for. <laughs> I'm glad you said that they were big because they looked like big Mickey Mouse hands for me. Like they looked gigantic and uh, I didn't know that they were supposed to be bigger. So I'm feeling much better about that. Um, but that was real more my question is, does it get to a point if you're always using the monadic uh, energy hands, is it almost like, okay, enough's enough. Like stop using me so much, you know, use your other <laughs> hands or... Do you know what I mean? Like, we're, we're working with patients all the time. Like, I, I, I would have a tendency to go there first, I think. And, and I don't want to abuse that. Is there a way to maybe ask and say, okay, which one of you guys would like to help? Sure, um, is, that would be perfect. Would that be a good yeah. way? And then whoever shows up, that's who shows that up. That is respectful. Okay. Cause, yeah. All right, great. As a matter of fact, we'll have to do a little bit of a closing practice, too, and we're coming to the point where we should probably be bringing things to completion. But I want to comment about the Mickey Mouse hands. Never forget to have a sense of humor about this work. We can get so serious about this kind of thing, and the higher levels of our being can't talk to us and inspire us unless we have this sense of play. We can't take ourselves seriously. And uh, I mean, I would worry sometimes if somebody got Mickey Mouse hands about whether they thought or believed it was Mickey Mouse. But the thing about the Mickey Mouse hands is they're gloves. Right? And that level of being, the monadic level of being, is beyond our con conceptualization. For us to have any kind of relationship with them, they have to put on a form for us to perceive them. And so it's the gloves that was more important than the Mickey Mouse there. Sometimes they'll show up as um, wings. And in that sense, um, it's almost as if every feather of the wing is another finger to touch you, to just absorb you and make contact even more. So that's another visualization to experiment with. So is there maybe one closing question? Yes. I had slept through the first four, five uh, exercises. <laughs> and uh, so uh, six and seven got my attention right away. But I, uh, so when we did this last one, I said, OK, uh, big hands, you pick. And I got a physical sensation around my heart chakra. I said, okay, you do that. And what I saw wasn't much. It was like a really quiet, uh, kind of an empty glass bowl, you know. And um, I said, okay, well, uh, do what needs to be done. And this black curtain went across my vision and stayed there. And I said, uh, you know, and time went on. <laughs> It stayed there. And when you said, you know, uh, um, you mentioned when it's done, uh, you ask for thumbs up or thumbs down or something like that. And I said, well, okay, you know, let me know. And from that same direction that what had been a black curtain turned this rosy hue. And I thought, well, I guess it's done. But that was it. I mean, I didn't get shown anything about what might have been going on. Is it possible that you would have analyzed what you were seeing to oh. try to understand? <laughs> oh, <it>? yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I've had other things with my crown chakra where, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't figure this out. Excuse us. Yes. This is our, our territory. Okay, so what's really interesting to me is when I teach classes, there's almost always someone in the room that gets a practice that I didn't intend to teach, okay? I don't know how that happens. One of these practices involves visualizing the heart chakra as a bowl, a clear glass bowl, and bringing into it a rose pink light, which is the light of unity consciousness. So. I'm getting chills. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's cool. Well, thanks for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say anything, but your previous comment, I thought, well, you know, if we're dealing with some level of mystery. But let's just talk one. about the value of that particular practice. So, you know, green is the color that we use, I use, to point the heart chakra in the direction of its own higher fulfillment. But if your work in the world involves a desire to be a vehicle or a vessel for unity consciousness, you can do a lot of good for yourself in the world by having not green, but having a rose light in your heart chakra. It, it attunes your whole field to the idea of buddhic or unity consciousness or 
universal brotherhood. Okay, so we'll do just one final little closing meditation, and I, I'm afraid I have to say this. Um, you're going to hate me because we're going to say goodbye to our higher energy hands. And, uh, you know, hopefully nobody will have the Mickey Mouse song that comes at the end of the show. <laughs> you know where it gets all sad. Okay. So focus your attention inward. Take a couple of deep breaths. And whether you use the lower energy hands or the higher energy hands, be aware of them. If the lower energy hands, they're on your shoulders, they're on your head. If they're the higher energy hands, they are completely encompassing your being. Once again, notice the shift in the energy in the room. Now, you know, if you're listening to New Age music, there's some New Age music that you don't want to go operating heavy machinery while you're listening to. And there's even a warning on the, the CD. We need to say goodbye to these higher energy hands and even the lower ones because we need to have our focus fully present in ordinary waking consciousness. So take a moment to offer some deep, heartfelt gratitude to this higher level of your being that helped you out in the work that we've been doing. And even if you didn't see them, it's always good to offer deep, heartfelt gratitude to everything. And then say goodbye to these energy hands for now, knowing you can call on them anytime you need them. Let them go. And remember your witness platform imagery. Go to your witness platform. See yourself on it. Feel that emotional neutrality. Feel how the energy in the room is all of a sudden really stepped down. This is our stepping stone back to ordinary waking consciousness. I recommend it after any of the practices like the ones we do today. And then dissolve or, or let go of that image of your witness platform. And just be fully present in ordinary waking consciousness in the physical body, on the physical plane, here in this room. Do whatever you need to do to complete that process. It might be a stretch or a yawn or a sigh. Certainly open your eyes. And now you're probably safe to drive home. <laughs> so um, thank you very much for your time and attention. It's been a real pleasure to work with you. You've been wonderfully um, open about sharing, which always makes an experience like this so much deeper. And uh, even if you didn't have the experience to be in a room full of people who did, might suggest that that's something that might show up for you sometime. Uh, the worst case scenario would have been, I asked for people's experience and no one in the room had anything to share. So um, that's when I start doing soft shoe routines. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you.